Hello friends, welcome to Science Talk. I am your host and resident oceanographer, Jim Massa. So a um, little departure from what I usually do, i.e. covering uh, information, articles appearing in peer-reviewed journals. Found, I came across this article in Science and uh, found it fascinating. I wanted to share that with you. Humans have broken a fundamental law of the ocean. The size of undersea creatures seemed to follow a strange but stable pattern until industrial fishing came along. Not until humans came along and mucked everything up. <laughs> oh, there's a picture of uh, various uh, marine invertebrates. Looks like some krill there. On November 19, 1969, basically 52 years ago, CSS Hudson slipped through the frigid waters of Halifax Harbor in Nova Scotia and out into the open ocean. The research vessel was embarking on what many of the marine scientists on board thought of as the last great uncharted oceanic voyage. No. But I just won't, before proceeding any further, you know, Halifax Harbor, Nova Scotia. In that harbor, you have the twin cities of Halifax and Dartmouth. Dartmouth is they're on either side of the river there, and there's a bridge, a couple of bridges connecting the two twin cities there. Dartmouth is where we find Dalhousie University. Dalhousie University has an excellent marine program there. In fact, it was researchers there at Dalhousie that first measured the slowdown of uh, the deep water formation in the uh, Gin Sea. I mean, where you know, basically AMOC uh, forms up. So they're one of the first uh, research groups to, uh, to measure that and quantify it. So they're going to do the first complete circumnavigation of the Americas. The ship was bound for Rio de Janeiro, where it would pick up more scientists before going through Cape Horn, southernmost point in the Americas. Yeah. <laughs> Nasty waters there. <laughs> and then head north of the Pacific, to go through the ice pack northern passage back to Halifax. Well, they probably would have an easier time of it today. Along the way, the Hudson would make frequent stops so scientists could collect samples and take measurements. One of those scientists, Ray Sheldon, had boarded the Hudson in Valparaiso, Chile. He was a marine ecologist at Canada's Bedford Institute of Oceanography, and he was interested in a microscopic plankton that was everywhere in the ocean. How far and wide did these uh, organisms spread? And you do what you typically do. You, you go and sample. You haul up. You know, they pulling up buckets. You can use, uh, you know, uh, what's called plankton bongo nets, which is a big net there and has a little, uh, basically a container at the bottom that then all the uh, organisms would be collected. You wash it down and then you go and analyze it. Life in the ocean. Now, this is an important paragraph here, so I'm just going to highlight that. Life in the ocean, they discovered, followed a simple mathematical rule. The abundance of an organism is closely linked to its body size. In other words, the smaller the organism, the more of them you find in the ocean. Krill are a billion times smaller than tuna but they're also a billion times more abundant than tuna. Part of the reason why so many krills can, there's enough krill to feed the big baleen whales, but you don't have billions of baleen whales in the ocean, right? What was surprising was how precisely this rule seemed to play out. When Sheldon's colleagues organized the plankton samples by orders of magnitude, they found that each size buck, uh, bracket contained exactly the same mass of creatures. In a bucket of seawater, one-third of the mass of plankton would be between 1 and 10 micrometers. Another third would be between 10 and 100 micrometers. And a final third would be between 100 micrometers and 1 millimeter. Each time they would move up a size group, the number of individuals in that group dropped by a factor of 10. The total mass 
stayed the same, but the size of the population has changed. A better way to state this would be the numbers of individuals making up the populations change. So in other words, if you increase the size of the, the, the individual, you have the same biomass, but there'll be fewer individuals. Make the individual smaller, there'll be a lot more of them so that you get the same biomass. So Sheldon formed the hypothesis that this rule might govern all life in the ocean from the smallest bacterium to the largest whales. And uh, that hypothesis uh, basically was demonstrated to be uh, correct. And it became known as the Sheldon spectrum. It's been observed in plankton, fish, freshwater ecosystems as well. In fact, the Russian zoologists had observed the same pattern in soil three decades before Sheldon, but its discovery went mostly unnoticed. So everybody, so, so that's a very important uh, finding there. But now humans, here's a shock, seem to have broken this fundamental law of the ocean. In a November paper for the Journal of Science Advances, Galbraith and his colleagues show that the Sheldon spectrum no longer holds true for larger marine creatures. Thanks to industrial fishing, the total ocean biomass of larger fish and marine mammals is much lower than it should be if the Sheldon spectrum was still in effect. Basically, we've messed things up in the ocean in more ways than one. To work out the Sheldon spectrum still held true, Galbraith and his colleagues brought together data on plankton, satellite images, ocean sample, models, predicting the abundance of fish, marine mammal population estimates from the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Now, Galbraith, Okay, Eric Galbraith, he's a professor of Earth Planetary Sciences Sciences at McGill University in Montreal. Just so we know what uh, institute he's associated with. In total, the group estimated the global abundance of 12 major groups of marine organisms from bacteria to mammals. They then compared the state of today's ocean with an estimate of what they might have been like before 1850, by taking into account fish and mammals that industrialized fishing and whaling have removed from the, from the waters. They did make an assumption that the levels of bacteria and plankton and smaller fish in 1850 are similar to today's levels. One could quibble about that because we are seeing a decline in planktonic species and therefore smaller fish species. But we'll set that aside, but that, that one, one could quibble with that. When they looked at the pre-1850 estimates, the Sheldon spectrum largely held true. That's what Galbraith and his uh, colleagues uh, found. The researchers found that in a pre-1850 scenario, biomass was remarkably consistent across size brackets. When they totaled up all the organisms that weighed between 1 and 10 grams, it came to 1 billion metric tons. The same was true for all the organisms weighing between 10 and 100 grams, and between 100 grams and 1 kilograms, etc., only at the very extreme ends of the spectrum, the smallest bacteria and the largest whales, did the measurements start to vary. Comparing these pre-1850 estimates to modern day models told a very different story. The model suggests that the biomass of fish larger than 100 grams and all marine mammals has shrunk by more than 2 billion metric tons since 1800. The very largest size classes appear to have experienced a reduction in biomass of nearly 90% since 1800. Many of the big fish and mammals that used to populate the ocean simply aren't there anymore. The world that I grew up in is gone, said Kristen Kaschner a marine ecologist at the University of Freiburg in Germany. Between 1890 and 2001, the population of all whale species declined from more than 2.4 million to under 880,000. Now that's total number of whales. That's not biomass, that's numbers. While the population of some whale species has rebounded since global whaling moratorium in 1890, uh, 18, 1986, a little dyslexic attack there, many are still endangered. 
While the majority of fish stocks are fished in a way that allows them to maintain or grow to populations, that's a questionable statement. Just over 34% of them are overexploited. That's another questionable statement, which means we're removing so many fish from a certain area that the populations cannot recover. We're actually removing a lot more. And so, yes, we're really depleting the stocks worldwide. Some of the fish stocks being overexploited include, include Japanese anchovy, Alaska pollock, and South American pilchard. We th I think we are moving towards a world where the default is not a natural system, which everything is as you had it before. There was human exploitation and intervention, says Kashna. Okay. Throw in the factor of you're changing the, the dy dynamics of the ocean, you're warming things up, you're making things more acidic. These are all going to adversely affect uh, uh, species and uh, in individual organisms where you could metabolically stress them out. So they may flee to find, for example, if the water is getting too warm, they'll flee to a, a cooler location, but then, oh, where, where's my food? You know, so there are other factors here at play. We need to you know, consider not just only the over-exploitation, the overfishing, but the changing oceanic environment due to climate change. So um, Julia Blanchard, who is an ecologist at the University of Tasmania in Australia, uh, she has studied coral reefs, and she's found out that when the Sheldon spectrum seems out of whack, it is a sign that the reef ecosystem is no longer healthy. If we're looking at improving that, what we might do is ask what would be a level of fishing to maintain the size spectrum. One problem is that fisheries often target what scientists call boffs, big, old, fat, fecund female fish. You know, large bodies are prized by fishers because you get more biomass. Your catch per unit effort is better. But if you're catching old fish, it means they're larger they're going to produce more eggs. Fecund is referring to how many eggs a fish uh, produces. We, we measure it called fecundity. So typically, the older and bigger the female fish is, the more eggs she will produce. Younger and smaller, not so many fish. So if you're removing those older female fish, you're going to hurt, impact negatively, the year class strength of the population. So, you know, boffs are a vital source of new baby fish. Yeah, I just explained that. Take these away and the size spectrum quickly veers out of, out of uh, equilibrium, out of kilter. So you want to encourage the fishing industry to target medium-sized fish, allow the mature ones to escape and replenish depleted populations. And here they finally uh, bring in the only challenge isn't just overfishing, but, you know, how the uh, warming oceans are getting too hot for 50% of fish species. And even 1.5 degrees of warming would still be too much for 10% of fish. If they're referring to the ocean warming up by 1.5 degrees, not the atmosphere, uh, that would be a valid statement. Overfishing means the population is starting from a much weaker point than it would otherwise be. Take too many fish out of the ocean, reduce genetic diversity, weaken food webs, weaken year class strength, allow ocean habitats to degrade, all which makes an individual ecosystem more vulnerable to changes. What's important is that as you fish out a system and then it's warm, it's much less resilient to that warming, said Blanchard. The good news is that this species can bounce back. They are extremely resilient, says Ken Anderson, a marine ecologist at the Technical University of Denmark. In September, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature moved four tuna species further down its list of threatened species after the population started to recover thanks to stricter fishing quotas and crackdowns on illegal fishing. It's easier to stop overfishing than it is to stop climate change, said Galbraith. If we fish less, if we allow ecosystems to recover, we can maintain that until the climate change destroys the ecosystem. Back in the 1990s, Newfoundland, the uh, Ministry of Fisheries in Newfoundland, shut down the fisheries completely. Totally shut them all down. 
You know, we're talking about the, the Grand Banks region. You know, Cod, Haddock, right? Totally shut them down. One of the meeting at the meeting that this announcement was made, one of the fishermen said, let's face the boys, we caught them all. That was about 30 years ago. In recent years, the fishes have been reopened. They did recover. So species can bounce back. Granted, one data point does not make a trend, but and it's anecdotal, but it at least shows the possibility of that occurring. So that, that to me is a very interesting thing. The Shel Sheldon spectrum that, you know, the smaller organisms you have, the more of them you have. But when you look at size categories, you end up with the same biomass. So obviously, if you have smaller organisms in size, you're going to need more of them to get to that biomass. And the larger they are, you need less individuals to get to that biomass. That's very interesting. Humans come along, mess things up, and we throw that spectrum uh, totally out of whack. And of course, we know about the issues of overfishing, overexploitation, etc. So here's another example of humans kind of messing things up like we do everything else. Thank you for your time. Hello, folks. This is Jim here with Science Talk, asking you to please subscribe to my channel and to inform others of my channel and of the work that I do. Please share to social media platforms that you use. Also, as a reminder, don't forget to click the bell so that you know when I load up more videos. Finally, I ask that you support the work that I do by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Details in the description box below. Thank you for your support.